Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, with us today is Christopher Drake, an internationally recognized expert in sleep and circadian rhythm disorders. He is professor of medicine at the Michigan State College of Human Medicine and serves as the director of sleep research for Henry Ford Health. He is the insomnia section editor for principles and practice in sleep medicine and serves as associate editor for sleep at sleep advances and behavioral sleep medicine. He served as chairman of the National Sleep Foundation from 2013 to 2014 and received the Distinguished Service Award from the Sleep Research Society in 2015. In 2016, Dr. Drake received the Pioneer Award from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. He has been funded by the National Institutes of Health since 2004 and has authored over 200 publications. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Christopher Drake. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I appreciate it. Welcome, everyone. Um, this afternoon's uh, talk, I'm going to be discussing a novel investigational treatment for hypersomnia, this being inaugural hyper, in the idiopathic hypersomnia day and uh, idiopathic hypersomnia week. I'm going to go over a little bit about where we are with the treatment of this disorder and where uh, we hope to go in terms of improving patient care. And first, I just want to thank Zevra uh, for their commitment to rare diseases. Uh, they are a company that's committed uh, to developing transformational therapies for patients. They're a really creative, outside-the-box company. We're, you're going to see a little bit about that in a moment when I begin to talk about this uh, new treatment and uh, are very uh, interested in bringing life-changing treatments to uh, patients with rare diseases and uh, really to try to get new therapies uh, advanced through the FDA so that we can improve patients' quality of life and care. So today I'm going to be talking about Zevra's work in idiopathic hypersomnia, which is basically top-line data that was just announced from its placebo-controlled double-blind phase two clinical trial, which is evaluating the safety and efficacy of a drug called KP1077, surdexmethylphenidate. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what SDX is in a moment in patients with idiopathic hypersomnia. We're also going to be presenting this uh, data in its entirety. What I'm going to be showing you here today is really the uh, open label part of the study, the patients that are on treatment as opposed to placebo. Um, but you can come by our poster uh, on Monday morning at the sleep conference down at the convention center at 11 a.m. We'd love to have a brief uh, discussion with you. If you have any questions, we're going to have some time for questions at the end today, but we hope to see you there as well. So first of all, what is the experience of patients with idiopathic hypersomnia? We can see obviously all patients in this particular survey uh, and all patients in general who are diagnosed with idiopathic hypersomnia have hypersomnia, right? So excessive daytime sleepiness, you can see there at 100%. But one of the interesting things is you see 80% of patients reporting something called brain fog. Brain fog is really conglomerate of symptoms uh, that really talks about, you know, talks to the sort of uh, symptoms of difficulty thinking, concentrating. We'll, we'll hear a little bit more about that as the presentation goes along. But patients are also struggling with other symptoms, for example, sleep inertia, that difficulty waking up in the morning, being able to get up uh, awake and alert, uh, difficulty uh, with, with waking up and long sleep duration. And one of the interesting things to note about this population is that despite treatment, many of these primary symptoms in idiopathic hypersomnia remain. So in fact, Brain fog and excessive daytime sleepiness remain in about 80% of patients. Um, and, and so we really need to address those things. And now I'm going to review a little bit about Zevra's investigational treatment uh, for idiopathic hypersomnia, which is called serodexamethylphenidate, which is a prodrug of demethylphenidate. Demethylphenidate is the active drug. It's then combined with a ligand to produce a prodrug that has potentially improved attributes. And in this case, what the prodrug is, is, is when it gets ingested, after that it begins to be cleaved very slowly and throughout a, a, a metabolic process. And so the drug activation is slow. You can take this drug at night and it begins to be activated slowly during the night and it, 
it begins to sort of reach plasma concentrations that are effective clinically by the morning. We'll show a little bit of a schematic about that um, here. So you can see if the dose is given in the evening, um, you can see this is just a schematic. This is not actual data, but the plasma concentrations would be expected to rise to peak somewhere around 8 a.m. and then slowly trail off throughout the day. And that's in QD dosing or once a day in the evening dosing. There's also a BID dosing in this particular trial, so taking it at night and then also once in the morning, and you can see a little bit higher levels during the daytime in that particular uh, schematic. So a little bit about KP1077 phase two trial design in people with idiopathic hypersomnia. We can see there's a screening period of approximately 35 days with a five week uh, open label, uh, six, uh, sorry, seven uh, weeks of trial itself um, with a, a double blind period, uh, five weeks of the trial in open label and two weeks in the double blind period where we withdrew about half the patients, uh, sorry, a third of the patients were on placebo um, and the rest of the patients remained on uh, their dose of KP1077. The doses range from 80 to 320, but in this case, it's a titrated study, so we're trying to get patients up during that uh, five-week titration period to appropriate levels uh, of, um, of drugs so that their uh, symptoms are sufficiently reduced, and then they maintain themselves on that particular dose for the remainder of the time. Now, the primary endpoint in this particular trial, because it is a phase two trial, is safety. We see insomnia at 24% as, as a, one of the AEs that are uh, greater than or equal to 5%, over, I'm sorry, over 5%. Insomnia at 24% of patients, headache 9%, anxiety 6%, nausea 6%, and decreased appetite at 6%. And we see approximately the same incidence and similar types of adverse events in each of the dosing regimens, both the BID and the once a night dosing. And in terms of insomnia, because that was the most frequent AE, just to sort of give you a little bit idea about it, it went, it usually occurred in the first week of treatment at the lowest dose, and it was not related to dose or dosing regimen. Okay, so important to know, it's was often transient and not leading to discontinuation from the trial and often did not prevent titration to higher doses and, and typically would go away after that first week uh, of treatment. Now, uh, many of the reported symptoms of idiopathic hypersomnia were evaluated as secondary and, and some primary endpoints in this trial. So excessive daytime sleepiness, sleep inertia is measured by a visual analog scale, severity of IH symptoms, and brain fog as measured by the brain fog scale. So I'm gonna go over those in turn here. We can see patients started out at pretty moderate to severe levels of excessive sleepiness as measured by the Epworth sleepiness scale. And over the course of the seven week trial, we see patients declined in terms of the levels of sleepiness well below what we think of as the clinically significant range. So these are individuals who get down to about a level of eight on the Epworth sleepiness scale. So uh, not really considered clinically significant for most of the patients at the end of this treatment period. So that, that effect size is very large and very encouraging. And what you'll also notice is that both the once a night dosing and the BID, two times a day dosing, had essentially the same effect size. So essentially the same improvement of excessive sleepiness in both of those dosing regimens, which is very encouraging. Um, we also see a little bit better improvement from the QD dosing. So dosing at night, the once uh, per night dosing, slightly better, not statistically significant because this trial was empowered to detect those effects. But again, a big effect size on sleep inertia, so showing a reduction in sleep inertia throughout the trial, throughout the seven week uh, trial. And down below what we would consider you know, clinically relevant, something below 50 on this zero to 100 scale. We also looked at something called the idiopathic hypersomnia severity scale, which is a global measure of idiopathic hypersomnia, looking at a variety of different, uh, both nocturnal and daytime functioning measures. 
and patients uh, rate of severity of a frequency of 17 questions using a four or uh, five point scale for each question. And uh, what we're really looking for is a total score of 22 or below, which is typical for individuals without any sleep disorders. So that's what we're really uh, trying to achieve here. And what we see, and again, both of the dosing regimens are very similar, going from a moderate level down to the uh, really not in the pathological range for most of the patients on both of these uh, dosing regimens in this, in this um, study. So very, again, very encouraging and strong results. Please, um, just to give you a little bit of information on the brain fog scale, you can see some of the questions here really focusing on cognitive functioning, so being forgetful, difficulty thinking, focusing, finding the right words, mental fatigue, uh, being confused, difficulty processing words, et cetera. And uh, so this scale, while it's not been validated in IH, the total score ranges from zero to 77 with a higher score being more impaired um, and neutral being 38, where you see the dotted line here. And again, and probably this is the most impressive of the results, we see uh, data showing that there's an improvement in brain fog, again, for both dosing regimens, the BID and the QD, throughout the seven-week uh, dosing period um, at a similar rate, and a very strong effect size here. So in conclusion, KP1077 is well-tolerated in people with IH after either once per day or twice per day dosing with meaningful improvements in daytime sleepiness, sleep inertia, and brain fog were reported by the participants for both dosing regimens, and we're gonna use this data to provide some insights for designing a phase three trial. So please come by and see us in the morning on Monday at 11 a.m. Um, for further questions, but I'll, I'm gonna go ahead and thank Zevra Therapeutics uh, for sponsoring this trial and this talk, um, but they'd also like to thank the patients and investigators who made this phase two trial possible. I'm gonna go ahead and stop things there um, and open things up for questions. So I believe we had a question online that I'll kick off first. Give me one moment. It is, will this medicine eventually be tested with drugs like Zywave to see if they are if they are safe in combination? Well, uh, we can't really know for sure right now. We're at a very early stage in drug development for this particular uh, medication, but that's a very uh, important question because in most cases, as I showed, uh, patients are struggling even after treatment, um, even with oxibates, uh, that's the case. And, and so I think it would be an important question to answer, but we just don't know that and how, how this turns out it just remains to be seen following the phase three trial. Okay. Thanks for any me. other questions in the room. Appreciate everybody's time. Thanks for, for coming by again, just another plug to, to come by on Monday morning to our poster at the uh, convention. Thank you.